guys, so I'm here today to do a video a lot of you have requested and that is my top 10 all time favourite pieces of classical literature. So what that means is that these are my personal favourite books from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. If you're not somehow familiar already, um, I am a classicist, I'm currently doing my PhD in classics as of 2018 when I'm filming this video and given the many years I've now spent studying classics I have of course read a lot a lot of classical literature um, both for my studies and for my own pleasure because it's obviously a period of history that I'm incredibly fascinated in it's also literature that I really enjoy exploring and discovering new gems within. So these, like I mentioned, are my 10 favourites. They are my favourites for a variety of reasons, but first and foremost because I enjoyed reading them and have subsequently enjoyed rereading many of them. They are not necessarily the 10 books that you should start your classics journey with. This isn't how I'm structuring this video. However, I do think many of these would be amazing places to start with classical literature if you're looking to get into um, the literature of the ancient Greeks and the Romans and it's just about picking which one sounds the most interesting to you. So I do own physical copies of all of these works but I don't have them all with me in uh, London. If I don't have the physical copy then I will link the translation I read in the description box as well as the ones I do have copies of. So let's kick things off with one of the pieces of literature that really sparked my interest in classical literature and that is Jason and the Golden Fleece by Apollonius of Rhodes. Now this is called the Argonautica in Ancient Greek and um, the Oxford World Classics Edition is Jason and the Golden Fleece. The Penguin Classics Edition might be Jason and the Argonauts. I can't remember, they sometimes change it around but um, there's also a famous film called Jason and the Argonauts which is this same story. I have read this translation here multiple times, it's quite beat up, I don't know if you can tell, it's covered in tabs, um, there's lots of scribbles in here as well from my notes. I first read this book when I was 19 I think, I was in my second year of university doing my undergraduate degree and I did a course on epic poetry where we studied three pieces of literature, this being one of those, and yes it is a epic poem. So it was originally written in verse and read like a long poem. This translation however is in prose. Um, I have subsequently read some verse versions but this is the translation I was introduced to it through and the one that I still adore reading. And I think prose translations can often make classical literature a little bit more accessible if you've had no experience reading verse before and that just intimidates you. Um, so I really like this translation. The story itself follows Jason who is an ancient Greek mythological hero who has been sent by his uncle Peleus to retrieve the golden fleece from the king of Colchis. The king of Colchis being the father of Medea who is also quite a famous character from Greek mythology if you're at all um, into that. And she and Jason during this book start up a relationship but this book follows the lead up to Jason arriving in Colchis so his adventures with his crew to get there and then everything that happens on the island subsequently. This is a piece of Hellenistic literature and I love it for so many reasons. It really sparked an interest in classical literature for me. It became one of the central sources for my undergraduate dissertation I just think it's a really readable, intriguing story and Jason is quite an interesting hero in comparison to a lot of the heroes in Homer's work which were earlier epic poems that had a massive influence on the genre because he's a bit useless. He pretty much accomplishes nothing of his own accord. He's either helped by his crewmates or by Medea or they do it for him and it just makes for interesting reading. It's really representative of Hellenistic literature I feel which is often quite sub Versive, it's experimental, it's trying new things as the Greek identity is changing and the world around the ancients is changing. And not only that, but it's a lot shorter than, say, the Iliad or the Odyssey by Homer, um, which is another interesting facet of it. So I think it's an accessible piece of classical literature as they go and I just adore it. But I think it would be wrong not to mention my next favourite after that which is the Odyssey by Homer. So like I mentioned Homer also wrote epic poetry. Uh, he was writing in the archaic Greek age however as opposed to the 
uh, Hellenistic period. And there is some debate about who Homer was, whether he was the first person to write down the Odyssey or the Iliad or whatever. It's really irrelevant to this video, it doesn't really matter. This is just a great book and the imagery in Homer's Odyssey is so visceral. It's one of the things that always caught my imagination about it. I think it's just a wonderful demonstration of the use of simile and it just creates really really vivid imagery. This again was originally written in verse and this is a translation I first read which is the one by E. V. Rue and is published by Penguin and it's also translated into prose. If you're really really set on reading some verse translations and I will link a couple down below but this is where I started so why not recommend it to you as well as it's what first um, made me fall in love with this book. It's a book that my dad um, really pushed me to read actually so it's quite special to me in that respect and the story follows Odysseus who is one of the Greek soldiers who fought during the Trojan War and he is now journeying back from the Trojan War but has been waylaid, is waylaid multiple times by various different people and gods and creatures um, that make his journey home take many many more years than a lot of his fellow soldiers so we're following him on that adventure on his journey from Troy to his home in Ithaca. We also find out about what is going on in Ithaca with his wife Penelope and his son Telemachus whilst he's away. And yeah, just lots of different little adventures. Like I said, he comes in contact with so many different characters of Greek mythology that um, there's constantly something new to get your teeth into. And I think as the plot goes, it's much more fascinating than the Iliad for me anyway. It's also a book I know a lot of people are introduced to classical literature through. But let's move away from epic poetry for now. Um, and return to what is still Greek literature but much much later and this is the Library of Greek Mythology by Apollodorus as it's titled in the Oxford World Classics edition um, I believe the original title is um, Bibliotheca and this is a collection of short stories almost I want to call it it's almost like a collection of little short stories and it is the best way to come in contact with Greek mythology for the first time I always think because this collects together so so many Greek and Roman myths and just tells them to you and it shows you how interconnected all those myths are because quite often it will continue from one myth by following another character from that myth to find out more about them and you get a lot of the big big myths like Odysseus and Jason but you also get smaller myths that you might not be as familiar with from popular culture and it's just a great book to to read mythology from. I just love this. It's such a go-to for me if I'm ever not sure what a myth is. Of course, you're, it's only one version of a myth. Um, and if you want to read more versions of the myths and become more versed in the nuances of mythology, then I have a whole, whole video dedicated to recommending books like this one. But I just think this is brilliant. I think it's really accessible. I think it's really fun to read. And who doesn't love? Greek and Roman mythology. I mean, you're watching this video, you must love mythology a little bit. Okay, so I think the Romans are starting to feel a little bit left out, so I'll recommend you a piece of Roman literature next, and that is the Satyricon by Petronius. This is a Latin novel that was written during the Roman Empire, and it is actually in fragments, so this is not a full thing, and I'm pretty sure if the full thing had survived, it would be massive, so <laughs> just be warned that that does make the narrative a little bit jumpy. However, what does survive is so wacky and weird and, hilar oft and oftentimes hilarious that I definitely think it's still worth reading. In the story, we follow two Romans and their slave as they get into, like I mentioned, really strange and outrageous situations. Um, the book itself is often times described as a bit of satire on the Roman Empire of the day and the, and the indulgence of the upper classes in Rome society, which adds a whole other layer to the reading experience. Um, and it is very, very wacky, very crude and explicit. So if you have a problem with um, lots of sexual references, then it's maybe not for you, but it is a fascinating and enjoyable, I think, piece of ancient literature. I remember the first time I was reading this as a whole 
whole, as I had read portions of it as a part of my degree but then decided I wanted to read the whole thing. I was actually going to Rome on holiday with a couple of my friends and I was reading this on the plane and I kept sort of sputtering with laughter out loud because it was just so funny. But whilst we're on the topic of novels, I have my next two recommendations for you and these are Greek novels. And the significance of this is that uh, prior to uh, books like these ones that I'm about to show you, Greek and Roman literature only really existed in uh, dramatic and poetic forms. Fictional narratives or mythological narratives were not written in prose prior to these novels. The kind of texts that were written in prose were historiography and philosophy. But then we get the rise of the ancient Greek novel which sort of begins in the late Hellenistic period and runs into the Roman Empire and both of these novels were written during the Roman Empire but they are Greek pieces of literature. The first one you will have no doubt seen me recommend if you've seen me recommend ancient literature before because it is possibly my all time favourite piece of classical literature and the one, if any, of all of these I would probably say go and read and that is Daphnis and Chloe by Longus. Now the ancient Greek novel follows a lot of different tropes, it is a genre, there's only five that survive and a lot of the points in the narrative are very similar, they could easily be described as romance novels. Um, this is probably the most subversive of all five um, and the whole story takes place on this one island and follows Daphnis and Chloe who are a goat herd and a shepherdess coming in to themselves as young people experiencing sexual desire for the first time and being attracted to one another. However, they don't know what to do. Nobody's explained to them what to do with these feelings. So they are desperately trying to figure out how to consummate their love, essentially, by observing the world around them and asking different people for advice. And it's just really entertaining. It, it's very entertaining, but it's also well written and um, if you then get deeper into classical literature, you'll see how interesting Longus is as an author and that he does some really clever things with this narrative. But beyond that, it is just an entertaining read, no matter how familiar you are with antiquity, I think. I then want to recommend to you Lucipe and Clytophon by Achilles Tatius. Again, this is an ancient Greek novel, it's a romance. We follow Lucipe and Clytophon on their journey to be together. In this one, our characters are oftentimes separated from one another. They run away from home because they want to be with one another and they constantly meet with um, different things, trying to keep them apart and separating them and um, causing their love to be delayed and their eventual marriage to be delayed. So rather than their own lack of knowledge keeping them apart, it's a lot of outside forces. Um, and this one again is just an entertaining story. And what I enjoy about this as somebody who just likes ancient Greek novels as a genre and finds it really fascinating is for me this, this contains a lot of elements of parody so it makes me laugh. And I really like it. That's everything I have physical copies of to show you though so I'll insert pictures of everything else. Back to the Romans, I know there is definitely less Roman literature on this list than there is Greek. What can what can you do? This is my favourite. <laughs> I do have two more Romans to mention. So the first one is Ovid and I want to recommend to you Ovid's Ars Amatoria or The Art of Love. This is usually published in bind ups along with his Amores or Love Poems. If it is The Art of Love I specifically want to recommend to you. The Art of Love is a three part epic didactic poem, so again in verse, that Ovid wrote on how to find a mistress in the first third, how to keep your mistress, you know, keep her happy in the second part, and then the third part is addressed to women on how to keep your man happy. And it's so funny. Again, I love funny things. I, I, I think Ovid had a bit of a wicked sense of humour and it really comes through in The Art of Love. It's a really entertaining read like I mentioned. Obviously not practical advice. Not even now, even in antiquity it's not very practical, um, especially given that Ovid was living in the Roman Empire during the time of Augustus who was very very anti-adultery and having mistresses. So in, again in many ways this work is very subversive and it's Ovid kind of writing again against Augustus and his purity laws. But then at the same time it's just entertaining for anybody to read. It contains advice like if you like a young woman go to the circus and offer to hold the bottom of her skirt up off the ground so it doesn't get dirty and then you might catch a glimpse of her ankles. It's that kind of stuff although it does get more um, in depth into sexual elements as you go on but it's just great reading. I don't know how to explain it, but I would highly recommend reading it. Ovid just is a brilliant writer in any of his works really, I would recommend, but 
Um, the Art of Love really got me on to the joy that is Ovid's writing and I will never go back now. I did mention there was one more Roman, so let me get him out of the way. And <laughs> that is Lucretius's De Rerum Natura. So De Rerum Natura is often translated in English into On the Nature of Things. So Lucretius again wrote this work which is an epic didactic poem written in verse. I've read the Penguin translation which is translated into rhyming couplet. Now I don't know Latin so I cannot speak to <laughs> um, the quality of this translation from that perspective, but it reads brilliantly and it was recommended to me by a lecturer in university, so I assume it's not that bad. And who doesn't love a rhyming couplet? <laughs> so Lucretius's Nature of Things um, is a philosophical work. It's all about Epicurean philosophy. Epicurean philosophy was a school of philosophy that started with the Greek philosopher Epicurus. And then um, a, a little while later we have Lucretius who uh, follows the school of Epicureanism and writes this work on the philosophy. And it's all about how to lead an Epicurean life. And a philosophy that I can get behind on many, many levels. Um, it's a philosophy that also stemmed from the idea of atoms and void, which was introduced by the philosopher Democritus um, before Epicurus, where the, they came up with the first sort of concept that we're all made of atoms, um, and they don't believe in things like the afterlife. Um, they also believe in living a good life and enjoying yourself, but uh, that's not hedonism in the sense that necessarily we think of it today, where you're super indulgent. It's about taking care of yourself as well, because if you're going to binge drink to the extent that you're ill, that's not living a good life. <laughs> that's not going to do you well in the long run. But it is about enjoying yourself and um, just sort of having a nice time whilst you're alive on the earth. And that would be my short summary of Epicureanism. Obviously there's a lot more to it than that. But I just think this work is so interesting. And it just reads really well. It's such a well-structured work and themes constantly arise and come back again. There's a lot of symmetry and it's just fascinating to read. I've read it a couple of times now and I think um, on a second and third reading you even get more out of it than on a first reading um, as a piece of literature. I have two more works for you to make ten and they are both works of Greek poetry. More poetry in the sense that perhaps we think about it um, which is short poems and the first is Sappho. Sappho is the only female Greek writer whose work survives until today which is amazing and it's also of phenomenal quality and um, a lot of it is love poetry and a lot of it is love poetry Sappho wrote to other women or about other women and um, so it's just fascinating work of the time because women having relationships with other women is not something that was particularly celebrated in ancient Greece so these poems are really wonderful insights into um, people's lives perhaps that weren't the norm and that weren't being celebrated and weren't mainstream and <laughs> all of that kind of thing. Um, and um, yeah, Sappho is just a writer whose poetry is beautiful and a lot of it survives very fragmentary but yet a few sentences can be incredibly beautiful. And they are very short poems so I'd say very accessible. And then I'd also like to mention Theocritus's Idylls. Again, these are shorter poems, often a page or two length and I read the Oxford World Classics translation again. And these are from a few centuries later than Sappho during the Hellenistic period again when, like I mentioned, Greek literature is being a bit more experimental and trying new things um, and a lot of these are about pretty mundane aspects of life. There's poems in there about going to the festival in Alexandria and the city and the hustle and bustle and women chatting to one another or there's poetry about bucolic scenes of um, young people lying in the field and falling in love and then there are some poems in there that are about mythological figures so um, like Polyphemus is Cyclops but in this instance Polyphemus is falling in love with a nymph and yeah, a lot of bucolic pastoral themes, um, uh, nothing quite as grand and heroic as, say, um, early, early Greek poetry like the Odyssey and the Iliad. And I just love them. So those are my top 10 favourite pieces of classical literature. It was very difficult to narrow down and I know somebody's going to mention that there's no drama, comedy or tragedy in this video. There are plays I like but I don't like them as much as the 10 pieces of literature in this video. Apologies on that, that is not 
to um, undermine the wonders of Greek plays. They are great, they're just not in my top 10. Um, but I would love to know if you've read any ancient literature, what have you tried, what did you think of it? Do you already have some favourites? Is this something you would like to try? Do you plan on picking anything up that I've mentioned in this video? I would love, love, love to talk about these books with you guys and classical literature in general. Now I do have a few videos on classical literature and specific genres already, so I will link those and the full playlist of classics and ancient history videos down below for you to check out. But until next time guys, happy reading and I'll see you all again soon. Bye!